Hot Topic. The Hargreaves Report. There are millions of Christians around the world excited at the prospect of a born-again, Bible-believing, Christian President of the United States. And that's why it's a great pleasure for me to have here tonight Senator Rick Santorum. Thank you, Senator, for being with us. Pleasure to be here. Met you first in church. That's right, in Des Moines. Yeah, Walnut Creek, Walnut Ch Creek Church in Des Moines. And you said something to me on that occasion, that you had a constituency of one. Tell me about that constituency. I usually say that and I, uh, I point my finger in the air. Uh, not for one, but for one. Uh, that's ultimately, that's who you're accountable to. And uh, obviously you have, you have a constituency that, uh, that you serve, you have a country that you serve, uh, but the, uh, the ultimate person you serve is, is God and you have to do things that, uh, that comport with his, his laws. And that's what I think America is, has always been about, is a country that uh, tries to achieve, always falls short of course, but tries to achieve a society that comport, you know, to, tries to live up to the high moral standards that, uh, that were set forth for us by, uh, uh, by the Bible. And uh, it's, it is the, in fact, uh, you know, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, which is our founding document, uh, it specifically mentions that our rights come to us from a creator, and that creator, uh, when, when he gave us rights, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, gave us responsibilities to, to exercise those rights in a way that are conformity with his laws. And uh, that's always been, as I said, the uh, the credo here in uh, in the United States that we try to uh, to have our civil laws comport with the higher on the, sacred uh, law. Sorry, I understand. When, when you were on the Huckabee debate and you said something that blew my mind, I was in my hotel room. And I said, "Am I really hearing this?" You talked about people asking for a truce on family values and biblical values, and you said that truce equals surrender, and you are for, not for surrender. No. Uh, it, truce in a situation where 1.2 million babies are being killed every year through abortion. A truce where the, uh, the institution of marriage is already under assault in several states here and has been changed. Truce where we are funding with federal dollars embryonic stem cell research and destroying human life for the purposes of doing research. That is no truce. We're, we're not allowing prayer in schools where you're, where you're making, uh, as with just what happened yesterday, where you're making the Catholic Church and other, uh, uh, well, the Catholic Church in particular, to, to have in their insurance policies contraception and, and, and abortifacients as things that are specifically prohibited by the church. Now the church is required under the federal law to, uh, uh, to carry in their insurance, in other words, subsidize it with church dollars. Uh, religious liberty is very much uh, under assault here, and uh, this administration is uh, is one that is as hostile to faith as any in the history of our country. And you have a combination of these things. A truce is not acceptable. We are not in a position where a truce is winning, it's losing. Now, you mentioned abortion. Um, the Bible says that the hearts of the fathers should be turned to the sons and the hearts of the sons to the fathers. If not, there'll be a curse on the land. And as a preacher, I can't think of any example of the heart being turned against the sons than abortion. Yes. As president, what can you do to reverse that? Well, I mean, there's a variety of different things you can do, both from the standpoint of pushing forth legislation uh, and uh, even constitutional amendment, where I'm an advocate of the personhood amendment and have a discussion in our country about when, when, is, what is life, when does life begin? And that's a, fi that's a scientific fact. Uh, I don't believe that life begins at conception. I know life, we can know this. Uh, we know that life begins at conception and as a result of that, uh, then we have to, um, we have, to have a, uh, a law that reflects the fact. And we don't. We have a law given to us by our court that specifically says in the, in the opinion that we don't really know when life begins. You know, you can argue about opinions. You, you're not permitted in, in a court of law to, argue, to, uh, to have different opinions on the facts. And, and so we need to, to have an education, uh, you know, an educational moment for our country 
and bringing up legislation and, and having public debates about this on, on important uh, issues is something that I have engaged in in the past and will so in the future. And you're a lawyer, so you know a little bit about law. I do. Now, the other hot topic, and it certainly is a big one in the UK, where it's in our parliament at the moment, is a whole definition of marriage. And um, where's your position? What would you do as the next president of the United States to define marriage as between a man and a woman as we see within the Bible? Marriage existed before government existed. Uh, marriage existed really from the beginning of time. Uh, the idea that men and women are complementary, and in fact they are. Uh, they, it, is, it is natural. It is the way not just God intended, but nature. Uh, if you're not a believer in, in God, that nature clearly intended men and women to come together and form unions, uh, and, you know, to allow the species to continue if, if at a minimum. And of course, in, in, in the case of civilization, men and women and marriage was an essential component of, of a, a healthy and stable society, of the best possible place to raise children. And when a society says that we no longer see this as a special relationship, that it is simply one of a number, a number of relationships that have equal validity, then what happens is you ultimately deny children their birthright, which is to be raised by and loved by their mother and their father, because you don't encourage it, you don't hold it up, you don't uh, you know, treat it as something that is special and needs to be nurtured. Society, habit, and, 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 and culture are vitally important things. Obviously, the British culture, how does that shape and form a society? It's, it's the, the habits and culture of a society are huge when it comes to what society you are going to be and such and so are your laws. And so when we fundamentally change habits and culture and society and say, oh, but it will have no effect on anybody, we know that's not true. The question is how deleterious of effect, and I believe it will be profound. We need to close by a couple short questions. You mentioned the phrase special relationship. And when we hear that in Britain, we think of a special relationship between the Britain and the United States. Santorum administration, would that be a strong and special relationship again? Because we kind of feel it's waned a little under the present administration. Well, we'd be, uh, we'd be asking for that bus back on the Oval Office of Winston Churchill. Uh, he's one of my, uh, he's one of my uh, political heroes. Uh, read, read a lot uh, about Churchill and uh, you know, have a tremendous amount of respect for two other British figures in history, William Wilberforce. Uh, I had a, a plate, the Wedgwood plate, uh, uh, am I not a man and a brother, uh, in my office in the United States Senate uh, when I served in the Senate. And I also had a portrait of St. Thomas More as someone who, again, was uh, a man of great courage and, uh, and, and willingness to stand up for his values and his principles. And so uh, I, I've learned a lot and, uh, from, uh, from people and uh, personalities in British history and uh, see without question a special relationship uh, between those two countries that must continue, not just for the benefit of our two countries, frankly for the benefit of the Western world. One other special relationship, Israel. Um, and many Christians believe that uh, we need to support Israel. Where would the Santorum um, administration? I would say that's uh, another very special relationship with the United States, that uh, Israel is, a, is our sole dependable ally in the very, very troubled region of the world and is one that uh, needs a dependable friend. And we, we should and must be that dependable friend. We should not be using Israel and the plight of uh, security plight of that country to political gain uh, for us or to, uh, uh, you know, even uh, some other types of geopolitical gains that this administration has tried by trying to curry favor with those who are anti-Israel, anti anti-Zionist around the world. Uh, they are a friend, we stand by our friend, and uh, uh, I think you won't see an administration that has a stronger record on Israel than mine. Well, I want to thank you for spending time with us. It would be remiss of me not to congratulate you on your tremendous win in Iowa. And as you opened your own speech, three winners, what a great country, a wide open race uh, that we, we're believing God for you to come through. There are half a million Americans in the UK, 
one final word to them. How can they help? Uh, how can they, you, you said, wide open race, join the fight. How can American voters and other supporters who are non Americans help the Santorum campaign from abroad? We've got internet and everything. How can we do it? First, the first thing is prayer, obviously. Please pray for us, pray for my wife Karen and our children, uh, for that hedge of protection around them. This is, uh, this is a very, very uh, stressful and trying thing that we see. There's a lot of people who, uh, who are filled with hate that uh, don't share the values that, that I do and, and find uh, our position one that uh, well, they can't just, they can't tolerate. It's very interesting that so much you hear about the intolerance of, uh, of Christians when in fact it's just the opposite, uh, the intolerance of those who, uh, who don't hold those values uh, because we are, we are, we are uh, taught as Christians to, to love and to uh, respect every human life and to uh, be tolerant of behavior, that, but that doesn't mean to be accepting of that behavior or accepting of different, uh, you know, the, the, when I say accepting behavior, when people do wrong, we, don't, we, to, we may tolerate it and, and don't treat them as bad people. But that doesn't mean that they don't do bad things. And, and we do that all the time in America. We, 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 we punish people who do bad things and break laws. But we also have forgiveness. And we also have, uh, you know, we give them an opportunity to, uh, to, to change and amend their ways. And that's, uh, that, that is the, at the heart of Christianity, at the heart of what, uh, what I believe. Senator Santorum, I really want to thank you for being with us. We will pray for you. We will uh, support you in prayer. And we say God bless you as you continue down the road to the White House. God bless you. God bless. The Hargreaves Report. So that was Senator Rick Santorum here in South Carolina on the night of the South Carolina primary. And now Senator Santorum faces his biggest test. And I don't mean Florida or any other primary, but the test that the Bible speaks about in Proverbs 27, 21. It says that the crucible for silver, the furnace for gold, but man is tested by the praise he receives. And much praise will be heaped on Senator Santorum as he continues to stand for biblical principles and for the things of God on the way to the White House. Pray for him as he's asked. Thank you for being with us. Oh, it's